Hello, and you're listening to Eco Justice Radio, a project of SoCal 350 Climate Action. Our show presents environmental and climate stories from a social justice frame featuring voices not necessarily heard on traditional, mainstream, or even public media outlets. I am Jessica Aldridge. On today's show, Radical Mycology, The Future is Fungi, host Carrie Kim interviews Peter McCoy, founder of Mycologos, the world's first mycology school and founder and creative director of Radical Mycology, a mushroom and fungi advocacy foundation. They discuss the grassroots movement and social philosophy behind using regenerative natural mushroom farming to promote ecological restoration and create food and medicines. Peter is a mycology educator and farmer, author, and artist from Portland, Oregon. He is the visionary behind the first annual Fungi Film Festival. In 2016, Peter published the book Radical Mycology, a treatise on seeing and working with fungi. Detailing his nearly two decades of experience in promoting fungi for the health of people and the planet. Fungi are everywhere, in soil and air, flowing waters on and within plants and animals, in food and clothing, and in the human body. Humans have partnered with fungi since the first loaf of leavened bread was baked and the first tub of grape must was turned into wine. Ancient peoples put the ravages of fungi to work in agriculture. Radical Mycology seeks to forge transformative relationships between humans and fungi, seeing lichens as indicators of environmental health and understanding the profound influences that fungi have held on the evolution of all life and human cultures. By symbiotically relating with fungi, we can engage in ecological restoration, mycopermaculture, mycoremediation after fire and oil spills, fermenting fungi for food and promoting fungi medicines for the benefit of generations to come. Thank you for tuning in to Radical Mycology, The Future is Fungi. Aloha, thank you for tuning in. My name is Carrie Kim, and today we're thrilled to have on the show Peter McCoy. He's the founder of the world's first mycology school and the founder of Radical Mycology. He's a mycology educator, mushroom farmer, author, artist, and the force behind the first annual Fungi Film Festival, which debuts this month. He's a passionate advocate for radical mycology, and uh, which teaches human beings how to align with fungi for food sovereignty, medicine creation, ecological restoration, mycopermaculture, community building, and creating resilient and sustainable lifestyles. I want to first honor the Tongva ancestors as our show is coming to you from Tongva lands, AKA Los Angeles. Welcome to the show, Peter. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, happy to be here, excited to, to get into the thick of it. You know, you, uh, given your life traje tra trajectory, we can see firsthand the expansiveness of your life devoted to radical mycology. And it just seems like that, perhaps that is what has propelled everything you've been able to do in such a short time. Would you agree that you credit the, your relationship with fungi? Oh, absolutely. I mean, mycology has been an absolute gift and blessing to my life. It's opened so many doors and changed me uh, as a person in so many ways and uh, led me to so many personal discoveries and an understanding about the world on so many levels. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's an incredible field and I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am today without, um, without working with fungi. Mm -hmm. It seems like people who really get involved and engaged and aligned with fungi have an exponential shift in their life. It just, you know, it seems to be the, the, the case, but, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, and we, it was, really um, backtrack to the very beginning and it's such a basic thing but sometimes it's important to have beginner's mind and I'm wondering if you can explain for listeners the difference between the terms fungi and mushroom. So I don't take for granted that everybody understands the difference. Oh yeah of course I mean the the unfortunate reality is that the vast majority of people uh, are taught next to nothing or essentially nothing about fungi throughout most of their their life unless they, they make the effort it's nobody's fault. It's just that 
mycology, the science of fungi is missing from not only our education systems from, you know, K to master's degree, depending on what you study, um, but even from popular culture. So we just never hear about fungi, learn about them, think about them. And so understandably, they're off everybody's radar. And most people, you know, can easily get confused about some basic terms. So fungi is one of the major branches on the tree of life. Um, and they're, they're the third major group of larger celled organisms alongside plants and animals. And they are similar to animals biologically on the cell level, but they have unique differences that set them apart. And then within the group of fungi, we approximate anywhere from 1.5 to upwards of 6 million species relatively, uh, put that in perspective rather, there's roughly 300,000 plant species in the world. So there's many, many fungi. We average about 2.3 2.3 million is the, the current conservative estimate, but we've only named about 100,000 or thereabouts, 150 oh maybe. Goodness. So we know so little about fungi and what unifies them, um, like I said, there's some cellular similarities and some biological growth kind of characteristics, nitty gritty stuff. Um, but fundamentally it's it's the, the, the tissue that they're made out of. About 1% of fungi are yeast, single-celled, and you know the famous ones make our beer and bread, and then there's a bunch of other ones that do interesting things in the, the insect stomachs and help with digestion of insects um, is a good example of what yeast also do. But the vast majority, the 99%, are, are netted. Um, they form a network of tissue known as mycelium, and they're also referred to as filamentous fungi because they're made out of sort of these threads um, of what we call mycelium hyphae. The simpler ones are molds and they just, they grow as a net like that. And then they produce colored spores that we see as green or black or pink. And then the more complex ones weave that network of tissue into a three-dimensional structure that we call mushrooms. And even under a microscope, even though it looks incredibly different than the stuff you'll find under a rotting log or under a rock in the forest, that's white and webbed and netted. Under a microscope, a mushroom is the exact same material, just condensed into this incredibly complex form. It's not a different organ, not a different tissue like we find. Plants and animals are made out of many different organs and tissue types. Mm -hmm. Fungi, mushrooms are are, are interesting, very curiously, essentially one type of tissue throughout. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's a more biological sort of uh, breakdown. But So a mushroom is a type of a fungus, but there's many other types of of fungi. And all the interesting stuff we're probably going to get into in this talk is going to really boil down to what mycelium is doing. The mushroom is just sort of like the apple on the tree. It's a thing we see. We can maybe eat or make medicine out of, talk about, describe, name, and appreciate for its beauty. Uh, But really all the ecological significance, all the ways we can work with fungi as humans by and large, apart from consumption, is all these interesting aspects of mycelium, of this tissue. And that's really where all the the magic happens um, and really where a lot of the the magic and, and mystery happens. What do you think is most important for people to understand about the mycelial network? You know, people, we're walking upon it every day and people, you know, but people, again, don't understand what's underneath their feet. Well, Enjoying. the uh, a term that I sort of, that came to me while I was writing my book a couple of years ago was this notion of seeing fungi. And that came while I was immersed in really wrapping my head around all the many, many nuances of fungal ecology. And, you know, when you boil it down in my mind, um, fungi are everywhere and they're, they're, they're literally inside of every single plant, um, filling the interior of all plants, doing, uh, again, an innumerable number of processes to support plant health um, and, and influence essentially all of life. But most people don't even know that, and they, and they just certainly can't see it because it's inside the fungi. So a, a big part about learning about mycology and, and why some people really get absorbed into it and, and have a lot of light bulbs go off and, and sort of paradigm shifts is... This realization that that this thing you've never heard about is all around you doing really incredible things, <laughs> but it's sort of hidden behind the veil or something. And and a lot of this these these processes. And again, we've only just started to really understand it in the last couple of decades, thanks to you know better research, more research, and, and improvements in technology, um, enabling us to to understand these critical essential uh, eco- ecological roles that fungi and primarily their mycelium fulfills. That we never knew up until just recently and if if we wanted to really summarize what fungi do in the environment why they're so important you know if they if the listener mm-hmm. takes away nothing else it's that fungi are some of great nature's greatest chemists and 
uh, chemistry is not everybody's most interesting topic, but as <laughs> far as life life goes, um, it's pretty essential that nutrients move around, that they are in forms that the next organism can eat. And fungi are, are essential for not only transforming things, so especially through decomposition, they break down the most complex things in nature, especially wood. And and then on the you know human end, the crazy chemicals and things we've we've engineered, they can break those down into simple compounds, simple elements, molecules, and things that other organisms can eat. So they help kickstart the cycling of life, the nutrient cycling, which is so critical to the environment. And then at the same time, they also move those nutrients around in really a, a profound way. Bacteria do some decomposition, of course, but kind of more, more simpler compounds, but bacteria can only move so far. There's single cells and you know, there might be a big colony of bacteria or something in the soil, but they can only move sort of one cell at a time. The thing about the network of mycelium mm -hmm. in the soils, especially, is they they span, you know, hectares and can move nutrients from one end of that giant network all the way across to the other end of the forest. And not only doing that, along the way, they're, they're sort of releasing compounds as they grow and go, uh, feeding the entire soil web um, and also feeding the plant partners that they might associate at the root level with. And this is this notion that people often refer to as the wood wide web of the mm -hmm. mycelial networks of the forest that are connecting hundreds, thousands of plant species all together and moving nutrients between them really in a coordinated way and where they need to go to really manage the life of the forest and not only the plants, but ultimately the insects that eat the plants and the, the herbivores and ultimately the carnivores. And, and for all these reasons, and many more, um, there's some soil fungi, especially that are actually considered the most ecologically significant because of all the chemical movement and transformation and sort of the sort of design of what plants do and do not live in an environment. Um, this group of fungi actually doesn't even produce mushrooms. You never even see them, but they're actually considered the most ecologically significant just because of this movement of nutrients. And, but when we, act, when we look at what all fungi do kind of together, um, it's, it's the, the, you got the decomposers on another end. You even have the, the fungi that might sort of kill off a dying or elder tree or something and help end its life cycle or help and potentially stop the spread of disease so that again, the nutrients return and everything cycles through. And a lot of that cycle closing and, and kickstarting is, is done by fungi. It is a fungi. You know, I, I love this quote, um, from a renowned mycologist, Paul Stamets, and he had said, that fungi are the interface organisms between life and death. I mean, yeah, they they're the, they're, they guide you know really so much of natural processes. In, in many ways, we're we're beginning to shift our our understanding, and and I think need to really reconsider some of the major paradigms we have and assumptions we have about how environments are are managed. We've always looked to the flora and fauna, the macro organisms that we can see, but perhaps it's really the fungi. Um, the third major uh, group yeah. of eukaryotes and major organisms that we don't see as much that are actually doing, you know, the, the bulk of the work, like, literally laying the foundation. And, you know, they're at that point of nutrient cycling. I like to think of them as recomposers, you know, not just decomposers, but yeah. they're, they're yes. re regenerating and, and recycling and reinventing um, life and helping succession move forward. And, you know, always reminding us that uh, nature implies change. Um, and stagnation is a human invention, and um, and they do this in a myriad of ways. You know, every everything they do sort of leads us back to some of these conclusions in my mind. And there's many things that we can teach, but at the at the core of it, it's this 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 nutrient movement, the, the elements of life, the essence of life, however you want to phrase it. And they're they're regenerating that. They're constantly reinventing themselves and reinventing the world around us. Would you consider? Would you say that the mycelial network is a network of consciousness? Well, it, I mean, there's certainly some sort of intelligence, I think, in especially all biology, there's some sort of something guiding the actions of living organisms. And what phrase and term we put on that is, to some degree, uh, guided by the limitations of our language. Um, <laughs> I don't think fungi have the same right. form of thinking that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, they might be something like a an ant colony, you know, an individual ant is not very intelligent, but together they, they have, you know, something on par of... Uh, of a simple simian or a, you know something like mm -hmm. that. Um, an octopus it has mm -hmm. neurons throughout mm -hmm. its tendrils. You know it's a distributed brain. Mm -hmm. um, and what is that? What's it like to be an octopus or a cephalopod? I mean, I don't know. Right. So I don't know what it's like to really be this distributed <laughs> mind, a distributed yeah. mind where where you have you know millions of of individual brains at the at the end of the mycelial network. It's this big web of it's kind of like a spider web. You can imagine. But it, it terminates and there's all these little tips everywhere. And, and every single tip 
and that network has essentially a little tiny brain. It's actually called a Spitzenkorper. Mm. Um, it's German for tit body, and it's a unique structure to fungal cells. It's one of their unique aspects, and the, it, there's a lot to say about the Spitzenkorper. It's really mysterious and interesting, um, but it's essentially kind of like the, the captain navigator of every little thread, and it, and it does so much to guide that individual threads sort of life as it also feeds back and communicates with the entire culture. And there's a lot of metaphor and overlap there with how humans interact in our environment and with our greater culture as well. But we see this with, with fungi. So, you know, our, our animals were, you know, humans were individuals, but there's sort of this meta organism of the culture we belong to, right. That mm -hmm. also has sort of its own level of intelligence that we can't quite describe because it's sort of beyond us. Uh, but we're part of, and mm -hmm. there might be something like that inside of the my mycelial networks. Mm. You know, I wanted to ask you why radical mycology. Can you? Why is it important to distinguish this from classical mycology? Why did you want to make that really clear? I mean, I just came out of my mouth one day when I was on the couch <laughs> with my friend. Exactly. I mean, it's well, we know it wasn't uh, accidental; it was deliberate. Yeah, I mean, well, at the time, um, I mean, I was in my. I was 21 or something. I was pretty steeped in, in uh, far left radical politics in college and stuff. And, you know, sort of the, the initial notion beyond radical mycology um, really came out of the, the realization. I was pretty heavily involved in, in sort of more forms of social activism. And my good friend at the time was really involved more, much more heavily involved in environmental organism. We both had interest okay. in both, but we had our suits. And together uh -huh. we had, you know, these combined um, appreciations for how fungi and how mycology could influence these different thrusts of trying to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And I had been, it had been something I'd been storing in my head for actually years and, and thinking about how mycology could fit into all the different things we can talk about that, you know, need improvement in the world. And when I was in my late teens and, and I got into mycology when I was 15. And so I've been thinking about it for years and I got more and more into global affairs and realized pretty early on that I watch all these documentaries. I read all these independent books and things. And no matter what the topic was, especially environmental things, nobody ever mentioned fungi in any form. And that always stood out to me. And I said, you know, why is anybody bringing in this, what I'm pretty sure is a pretty important part of the world into in any form, into any of these analyses of, of whatever the topic is. And so I, I started in the back of my mind trying to make connections and, and would try to talk to my friends that are into like politics and they didn't understand what I was talking about. And it wasn't until I met this friend in college who who got what I was getting at and where where it started was you know I, I had shared shared with her all these ideas i've been having and she you know we bounced stuff off each other and then eventually i was like you know i we should write this down i should write this down into uh to a zine it was the first idea and i was like i'll call it radical mycology it'll be sort of all these blends of you know sort of activism thoughts and sort mm -hmm. of the milieu and sort of the major arguments or sort of the things that we might talk about and how fungi could could weave into that mycology could weave into that and that was where it started and um but that was just the starting place, you know, over, over the years, the whole notion of what, yeah, that, I mean, I've gotten this question many times, what does it mean to be radical mycology? For me, it's, it's more like an open-ended question. What does it mean to you? You know, the, the, what's really fascinating about mycology is that it's one of the youngest natural sciences and it's very open-ended about what the future of it holds. And it's one of the few sciences that people can dramatically, the amateur can dramatically contribute to and, and, and is and readily invited to contribute to compared to most sciences. We, we know so little about fungi. We need more people to help us figure right. it all out. Well, if you say there's why, in species, you know, and that's just naming them, let alone figuring uh -huh. out, you know, what are they doing in the world and how can we work mm -hmm. with them and apply them in human design and make the environments healthier. And so, you know, it's, I think it's very limiting to say that mycology is one thing or another. And so for me, I'm, I've always been a person to sort of question things and, and think outside the box. And so that for me, the, the radical mycology has always been sort of almost a philosophy of, you know, we let's, let's not pigeonhole this science that is potentially mm -hmm. bottomless as far as we can see it. Right. And let's always challenge ourselves to be sort of on that radical extreme you know cutting edge thinking really differently about what it means what's the possibilities um to me that's what always appealed to sort of fringe top whatever fringe topic fringe politics sure but also really i'm, all, I'm interested in all kinds of eclectic stuff because it challenges you to just think differently about the world and your place in it and mycology in so many ways does that just in its own right mycology is inherently i think radical because of all that it does and, and shows us as i got to a few minutes ago and so let's take that even further and just say like, okay, mycology already is like a fringe sort of eclectic topic and, and makes you, you know, think about the world in these different ways. And let's push that even further. And if you want to, sure, I mean, put it into any context. And, and I think a mycological analysis or perspective into any facet of the world 
might shake things up down to the root level, to the radical level and, and make you sort of reassess, uh, you know, your, some of your basic assumptions about, um, life. I'm going to put, um, hold right there, um, Peter, and we're going to take a short break and we will come right back. If you were just tuning in, you were listening to Ecojustice Radio. On today's show, Radical Mycology, The Futurist Fungi, host Carrie Kim is interviewing Peter McCoy, founder of Mycologos, the world's first mycology school promoting mushroom and fungi advocacy. Peter, tell us about the mycocultural revolution. It seems that we are on the cusp of it now, that it's already happening. And could you tell us how you feel it's happening globally? Well, you know, another 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 phrase that comes along with the notion of the mycocultural revolution is that the, the future is fungi, and it's sort of a play mm-hmm. on um, popular phrases. Mm-hmm. But it's this notion that we're we're, we're leading into a new era um, in the world of mycology of, of working with fungi on a level that has never been possible in human history, and we're at the really the, just the the first baby step into this whole new era. Um, I like to think of the history of the human fungal relationship, what we call ethnomycology, as broken into four major volumes. Like mm-hmm. if we're telling a long story as, as a part of the human story. And the biggest and first volume is the traditional ways humans have worked with fungi. It's actually fascinating and, and long and has many chapters and is constantly actually being added to as we learn more about the rich mm-hmm. history of people around the world working with all kinds of fungi. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that era, um, if you will, ended in some form. I mean, of course, many traditional ways continue on, but if we want to put some sort of line in the sand, uh, the next major break uh, began when the science was formalized. Traditional knowledge was you know, written down mm-hmm. by Westerners, and uh, that started the formal science of mycology about 250 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, about two year, 200 years was spent just trying to name fungi, categorize them, understand you know, who's out there, what are they kind of doing. Mm-hmm. And then in the early... Uh, the the middle of the 20th century, we had another change in our cultural relationship with fungi when psychoactive fungi were brought into the scene um, in modern society. And that brought fungi, especially in the West, back into more popular culture. And, and also, obviously, the relationship with it wasn't so long, so much about the food and about the, you know, heal, the medicinal benefits and, and other uh, ritualistic uses of fungi, but more about, um, you know, the, the psychoactive effects and all that that implies. Um, and then a couple decades ago, uh, there's several points along the way you can mark maybe the beginning of a transition into now this fourth major era where, as I mentioned um, in the first segment, the especially some of our insights via technology, but also just more researchers and, and the science evolving, we now realize not only are fungi incredibly significant in the environment, but thankfully throughout the 20th century, our means to cultivate fungi have greatly improved and become incredibly simple such that you know now anybody can grow mushrooms in their kitchen just like any other fermentation hobby mushroom growing is essentially a fermentation practice and so when we marry those two advancements together not only the ability to understand and to see fungi in the environment but to also work with them intimately and almost in any setting and context uh, the applications of those two forms of knowledge are leading to all these this sort of revolution this whole new realization that fungi are not only absent from our paradigms of the natural world but in how we design human systems to make them not only you know more productive or whatever but significantly more holistic more generative better resource management and and more in tune and, and better at mimicking the natural world natural processes that that fungi guide um, as i said well, before I, go ahead so well so yeah so that's that's sort of the revolution of it it's sort of this big overturn not only the world of mycology is sort of now it's become, you know, becoming much more open source, much more in the hands of the um, outside of academia, where it's been for most of its 200 year history. But now, you know, you get all these minds, and thanks to the internet, of course, everything's just changing by the day. And what does tomorrow hold in the world of mycology? What does the next 10 years hold? I mean, I can't even predict um, because you, you get new people with new insights, right. different backgrounds, different minds, uh, adding to this very young, very small, small science which again is is very unique you know we're we're often told we already know everything about the world so why even try Mm. mycology reminds us that there is much that we don't know and there's actually a lot of potential um, Mm -hmm. in it right it's more uh, creative and exploratory and uh, experimental and so forth but you know i'm wondering around the world are there certain um, places in the world that you find um, there's more respect for the fungi and that they are have developed a closer relationship that is already still 
in existence. I mean, certain countries seem to definitely have more of a relationship, whether it's through cuisine and things like this. But I mean, do you find there's other places where where that relationship has continued as a thread stronger than here? Well, of course. I mean, you know, um, in Europe or well, the probably some Mexico of the, the, the or in South America. Mm -hmm. Some of the easiest places to point to are places like Japan and China, where um, mycophagy or fungal consumption, mushroom consumption, um, and actually not just mushrooms, but other fer fermenting fungi of, mm -hmm. of many types are are just as in central part of cuisine mm -hmm. and maybe aren't so much revered per se. I mean, it's just sort of like how much do we revere, you know, pasta or something like that, which is such a common ingredient or tomatoes or something. Whereas in North America and in Western Europe, and especially, you know, the United Kingdom or something, um, mushrooms are definitely sort of an afterthought and, and very limited perspective of what even mushrooms you might want to eat for the average person. Mm -hmm. And so even just there, you know, on which mu mushrooms as a part of your your daily practice, um, there's a huge difference there. And in traditional Chinese medicine, good number of fungi are highly revered for their health benefits mm -hmm. and are a major portion of that traditional um, health system that, of course, you know, many herbs and mushrooms are missing from, from allopathic medicine. So there's a big difference there in the West. And then, you know, beyond that, uh, it, I would say, you know, for my, I haven't been to China or Japan, but as I understand it, talking to people who are from there, have taken you know, classes or whoever I've met along the way and, mm -hmm. you know, have told me, you know, yeah, sure, we eat mushrooms. It's a big, it's really common, but again, we don't really celebrate them. It's not a major, major thing necessarily. Right. Um, in other parts of the world, you might still have some, some traditions that have been carried on where mushrooms aren't even um, necessarily used for food or medicine, they might even be worn as, as necklaces or, or burned as a type of smudge. Mm. Um, but those, those lineages are kind of pretty few and far between outside of, outside of uh, China and Japan, you know, you have other Asian countries that eat a lot of mushrooms, Mexico, Korea. Um, in, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and in, in Mexico and Guatemala, there's um, quite a number of indigenous communities, especially that have uh, rich history and, and rich existing and practice. Yes. Of, of using and harvesting wild mushrooms mm -hmm. um and the indigenous and, and, on this land on these yeah. yeah yeah and again but it's just sort of you know um few and far between as i understand i mean there's no great resource um for say north america uh, united states and canada of uh, indigenous peoples and their uses of mushrooms you know and, and thoroughly documented into one resource you have you have bits and pieces in different texts and some historical accounts and chroniclers from 100 years ago writing various things down but um it's not well recorded to people outside of the traditional cultures and even to the varying degrees i've talked to a handful of people around the country um, of indigenous background you know they they might not know very much from their own past or their own ancestry right. so how much is perpetuated really varies from place right. to place if it's been passed down you know could you explain what you feel how do you feel that fungal ecology can help us view the world differently as it as you've said it changed your own perspectives on life and you know wonder if you could give a glimpse into how 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 you envision that could really spark again this whole revolution around um microculture well it's i mean it's really as um sort of essential as as understanding how soils work and that's not a topic that floats everybody's boat but it's it's pretty essential if you're into land management or you know tending land in some form uh soil of course being the, the, the central axis of life on land and the fungi are, are are really central players in that we've of course you know 80 years ago they just thought it was inert minerals and then we figured out the bacteria mattered and now we're realizing all these these fungal roles that complement and work with the bacteria and other microbes and organisms in the soil as the whole soil web is incredibly interwoven and complex but again the fungal roles just poorly understood um, poorly you know assessed for so long until just a couple decades ago or just starting a couple of decades ago i guess the the awareness has start, started to grow and then you know flash forward a couple decades and now we can say quite a number of things that are not only compelling but again just really tend towards a reassessment of of who comes first when we consider the health of an environment you know again um, I, I mentioned the whole flora, fauna, and fungi notion, and that comes out of the realization that environmental assessments, environmental protection agencies around the world 
things like this, they do not assess fungi. It's just not a part of their their <laughs> conservation efforts or even their 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 health metrics of of an environment. How much rotting wood is there? I mean, it doesn't even matter. And and you know, there's that's an essential part of nutrient cycling that fungi are the the only ones that can do um, or or initiate. And so just adding that in, it's kind of, you know, the answer is a little bit unknown because if if only every person that worked in natural habitats and whatever habitat restoration or management or or ecological design, um, if they just had a, a, a complete and fairly thorough understanding of fungal ecological roles, um, I'm sure it would complement many existing practices and inform and better inform them to be Again, more just more holistic. I mean, you just it's fungi are just such a critical and huge player in all natural processes. To not even know about them, I mean, you just you're missing a gigantic piece of the puzzle that you think is complete. It's very um, bizarre. I mean, I I bet you've mused on this before as to see why this big gap in in knowledge. Why is it that it's one of the most fundamental things in in the cosmos for us or on land and why it is that we have such a deficiency in this understanding. It feels like there's a break. And I don't know if it's because people consider, you know, mushrooms too wild or they they have fear around. I, I think Paul Samus has also talked about people's fear about mushrooms. I mean, things, um, trying to explain why it is that we would have such a um, huge gap in our understanding. Well, the answer isn't clear in Western culture, you know, especially, um, sort of uh, British United Kingdom and, and then in colonization in many respects uh, it's pretty your sex in North American uh, contemporary North American culture why did that start I mean and I, I'd make the distinction because in, in France and Italy and Germany you still have a pretty in other parts of, of Central and Eastern Europe and even Scandinavia you have uh, still existing traditions of harvesting you know maybe mm-hmm. chanterelles or more popular mushrooms and right. there's that has continued on it's not as unusual to be a mushroom forager um, as you might think in the middle of the United States or something. (laughs) And so the question is, you know, again, why that happened? A lot of people, you know, there is no clear answer. The, the best assumption is that in the, you know, mid 1800s, the British culture, you know, was, was very hesitant to associate or be um, near anything related to decay and and dirtiness and fungi really epitomize the the (laughs) wildness and the the soils of nature and Uh yeah the recycling of the 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 movement of life and the the unknown aspects of of the end of life and the recurrence of it through soils and then perhaps there was sort of an intentional shunning of this topic of of decay or decomposition or recomposition you know I, I haven't seen any like you know clear documentation from the head of the public education in the 1850s, you know, Europe saying, let's remove, <laughs> let's remove the composition. <laughs> but, but that's what people sort of uh, lean to. The, the, the bigger question though is, you know, yes, it, it started somewhere or somewhere there was some sort of intention must right. have been there to, to exclude this, but why has it taken us so long to even add them into you know, saying some people might just say, "Well, we just really didn't know that much." I mean, mycology is is arguably one of, if not, you know, the youngest major natural science, kind of depending how you define these things. And most of its history was just trying to just name and sort out mushrooms, and you know, there's only so much you a teacher can explain to teach to students about that. We didn't scientists rather didn't separate fungi from plants until the late 1950s. Mm. That's how young are are an understanding of how unique fungi are Mm -hmm. in the natural world. For so long, they were thought to be simple plants. Mm -hmm. And so, um, this is kind of a perfect perfect a segue actually to Michael Logos. So this is your school where you teach mycology, arts, and technical sciences in the forms of biology, ecology, mycoremediation, cultivation. I I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the inspiration behind the school and what are people uh, doing at the school? You know, what are they learning? What kind of offerings are there? Well, so my interest in the social implications of, of the transformative effects of mycology led me to not only write the radical mycology zine a long time ago, but to soon thereafter start holding an event um, alongside other organizers called the Radical Mycology Convergence, where not only would we share information, but more importantly, and we always said this from the beginning, was to bring people together around this, this at the time, what was still fairly fringe appreciation for 
fungi from ecology and to show that it's not to be taboo anymore, that it's, it's normal, it's important. Let's, let's make this a collaborative effort to, to bring this science forward for all that it implies. And, but also let's have a lot of fun and, you know, celebrate uh-huh. this and, uh-huh. um, and think about how we can, you know, take, take the future into our own hands, you know, remediation being a big part of that. We could, we can make the, we could literally make the world a healthier, better place uh, in some form through remediation. We don't have to go through bureaucracies. We can do it ourselves or do it together. And that was a big part of uh, the convergence. And, and, and we still do those every other year. But what I realized after doing a few of them was that uh, people would get excited and then they would, you know, leave. And just like I had been for so long, leave essentially you know, with nowhere to learn more. Mm-hmm. And it took me a very, very long time and a lot of diligence to to wrap my head around this uh, broad science. And mm-hmm. so then I decided to write a, a book that compiled everything I'd learned up to that point after about uh, 15 plus years of, of being involved. And that book was called Radical Ecology with a subtitle and that came out and it was the book I had always wanted growing up. It sort of compiled all the best information I'd ever come across and some of my own insights. And uh, the book was well received, but what I actually realized while writing it is that the book is primarily a, a reference guide and it introduces mm-hmm. many, many aspects of mycology, but they're all just tips of you know many icebergs that I, I know the depths of. And so I realized that there's a lot more that I, I would like to share that like one book cannot do and, and multiple books couldn't even do. And the best way to do that is through a variety of short and long form classes that deep dive into these many, many aspects. And so that's what led me to, to uh, form the school, Michael Logos. And that's in Portland, yes. Or I mean, it's online, right? So anyone around the world could attend the school. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we're an online and in person school. There's there's other people, of course, that, that teach mycology courses. Primarily, cultivation is the most common aspect, mm-hmm. most common thing you could learn, you know, right. in this country and in some other countries. Uh, I'm really trying to take it much, much further than that. Definitely, cultivation is a big part of it other applied mycology courses, but really, you know, currently our longest course is 14 weeks of fungal ecology. I mean, it's, it's pretty niche, but a number of people are quite a number of people are taking it and, you know, it's really trying to move the science forward because there's, there's literally, as I understand it, I mean, as far as I've ever seen, there's no course like that one, especially anywhere in the world. Right. Um, it's really unbelievable. Most universities don't even have a mycology department, let alone even a, a, an actual mycologist on staff. Like mycology is very <laughs> poorly represented in academia. It's, it is very difficult to even learn mycology uh, on, the te- on the sort of traditional academic level, um, which I'm in, all in favor of and I'm in support of all the science aspects of mycology. But then the applications, the arts of applied mycology, as we say, um, very hard to learn that. Um, very few places, you know, other than self-learning through the internet and things like this, but it really, a lot of it, it's, there's no apprenticeship programs. I mean, that's what I'm, I'm working to build out as well. Eventually is in a whole apprenticeship program so that, you know, the knowledge doesn't just lay in my hand or really at this point, just a handful of people's hands. Um, I really think for the microculture to truly be a revolution, it needs to spread quickly and, and further, you know, and, uh, you through school, people, right. To reach more people, I mean, it becomes an exponential process. You know, you teach one, they teach 10. Mm. And um, that's my, my greatest skill set I've come to understand of myself is, is uh, passing on information. And that's what I, uh, I'm excited to do and, and why I started doing I set up Michael Logos a few years ago. So there's, yeah, we have uh, many hundreds of students around the world taking our courses we have three currently available. One's just like a, basically, if you know absolutely nothing about mycology and you just want to get a sense of a little bit of this, a little bit of that, what's out there, we have mm-hmm. one of those. We have one that's a pretty deep dive, pretty good deep dive into mushroom identification. And that applies to most anywhere in the world. And the way I structured the course is really meant to help people almost anywhere in the world identify their local mushrooms. And then this longer fungal ecology course, we released those last year and then have been working based on the response and the feedback and the the sort of all the suggestions and stuff from students there are working to put out many more courses but with sort of quite a number of enhancements and and additions due to the you know all the good suggestions there so there's a lot more in the works Um, of course all the craziness of this year is sort of throwing (laughs) some wrenches along the way but yeah, I'm super excited. We have we have a pretty good team here and a a really good space. So right now of course the classes are online but Historically, I've taught a lot of classes all around the world, especially all around North America. I've, I've done many workshop tours, and once we're doing a lot more in-person stuff, we'll do quite a lot in Portland, but I'll probably also be 
pop it around on the Different continent. Different places around the globe. That's yeah. wonderful. I mean, it's so important. The work you're doing is so important. We're going to take another short break right here and come right back. If you were just tuning in, you were listening to Eco Justice Radio. On today's show, Radical Mycology, The Future is Fungi, host Carrie Kim is interviewing Peter McCoy, founder of Mycologos, the world's first mycology school promoting mushroom and fungi advocacy. Tell us, you have Mycologos, and I believe you also have the Mycologos demonstration farm. Is that happening right now? Can you tell us a little bit more about the farm or if it's not? Um, instituted yet what your vision is for this farm yeah that's uh, thanks for asking yeah i think there's a first interview where they talked to you about asking about that um so <laughs> we, go. we have <laughs> yeah um well so it's meant to be once especially we're doing more in-person courses so for our cultivation courses and some of our remediation workshops and things we would have it'd be for people to see and really see it demonstrating working I like to call it a, a, a sort of micro urban demonstration mushroom farm. So currently we're not, our thrust isn't, you know, producing fresh mushrooms for market every week or having, you know, regular restaurants or grocery stores we're working with. We, we will in time, but really what we're doing currently is, is just experimenting with lots of different uh, techniques. There's many out there. And so kind of going through having the resources and, and I've been building up the team for a while to just try everything and document it and be really able to, translate you know all these different options it's just like you know vegetable farming or animal husbandry there's many ways to do it and you know over the years i've done many of them there's many i hadn't gotten to so we're, we're going through a lot of that it's a lot of the experimentation just on rope mushroom cultivation mm-hmm. but really beyond that it's where it's a it's a fungi farm so we're not just growing mushrooms we're growing other fungi um uh, experimental fungi i mean it's more experimental i mean the purpose of it is for that well, ultimately, well, there's some, you know, secret projects in the works. Uh, there's there's reme- remediation um, experiments we're working on. Uh, a big interest of mine going forward is creating a, a culture collection of, of the native fungi of, of my bioregion and um, making that a, a resource for other organizations. And there's that's sort of being built out. Nothing like that exists. Um, so it's it's that's amazing. There's a lot of ways to uh, use the skills that are behind mushroom cultivation for many other Purposes. many other u- uses, and there's, there's actually many applications of it that I don't think I've ever actually been I've never seen that I that are on my sort of checklist, and so it's a lot of that. And again, I have to be a little bit vague with what we're working on, but it's at the core of it. I mean, you know, I like to say to people if, if you've never grown mushrooms, know anything about it, it really is not only a fermentation hobby if that makes it feel a little more accessible to you. But it's similar to growing plants, you know, or maybe growing orchids. Mm-hmm. You know, you can grow a plant, you get a basic understanding. It needs this you know, basic things to live, and you feed it mm-hmm. that, and it'll should live. Some are super easy house plants, and then orchids need a lot more ten to eleven care. Yeah. Mushrooms are, you know, somewhere in towards the orchid end of things. There, the concepts are pretty simple. Some mushrooms are kind of like a really basic house plant; they'll grow in almost anything really easily. Mm-hmm. Some need a little more attention, need a little special habitat. But once you dial it in and sort of dedicate the the uh, setbacks, you know, or just have to dedicate time to having a few setbacks and working up the kinks. Um, it's just like any other hobby you can you can easily set up um, on whatever scale. And so, um, what I'm so a lot of what I do as a teacher is I have kind of all the tools you might ever want. Not that you need all of them. I have all the different sizes, and so mm-hmm. it's kind of like we go through each station, and I show you, you know you can get this little simple tool or the big one, and then it does the same job, just makes the bigger one makes it easier, that kind of thing. And then the application of having those, you know, tools um, is you can then quickly or more slowly, depending on what you have as your setup, do all kinds of interesting things. Grow mushrooms, sure, but also work with all kinds of soil fungi, uh, run all kinds of experiments, grow fungi and all kinds of chemicals, uh, try to clean up your environment and, and teach others. Are you are you currently engaged in any specific micro remediation projects yourself? I don't know if that's something that you do or like, I know your focus is a lot with education and spreading awareness. and but I'm wondering if you are doing any specific kind of projects or experimental work for for others, even. Yeah, so I'm, I'm the I'm the lead mycologist of an applied microremediation company called MycoCycle, and the the work we're doing there is trying to see how we can turn some of the worst waste streams of existing industries into either remediate it, uh, clean it up via fungi or, or turn it into an up, upcycled uh, fungal 
product, if you will, or, or fungal um, byproduct. And so one of the things we started with among the several major industries that produce, of course, a lot of stuff that historically has just gone straight into landfills. And, you know, we all know how bad that is. Well, right. as you may also know, we're running out of landfill space and actually a lot of landfills are turning away these companies and mm-hmm. a lot of these industries and they don't really have anywhere to go and, and changes haven't happened in the industry and will probably anytime soon to deal with the, these changes. And, and also there's just a lot of stuff that has been stockpiled that um, sure. needs to be dealt with. So we're looking at the potentials there. Some of the stuff we've looked at is um, transforming landfills with some um, micro remediation, trying, trying to address some of the issues that some of the bottlenecks in the landfill issue. So we've been sort of chiseling away at a few different uh, applications there for a while. Um, some of the work I'm doing, so that's uh, through MicroCycle. Some of the work I'm doing here, Michael Logos is looking into ways to uh, try to try to treat in some form, even just on an educational or inspirational level, because um, it's such a daunting, big, big problem. Is the Willamette River here in Portland, which mm. is a super fun site in Portland. Mm-hmm. You know, thinks of itself yeah. so green, but it's this actually really polluted river in the middle of our city. Mm-hmm. And there's there's actually some interesting applications of of working with fungi that could could help with that. And so that's one of the things I'm, that's near and dear to me. I'm a Portland uh, native, grew up here and lived here my whole life, so, or in Oregon. Um, and so, but, and then there's a lot of, I mean, kind of going back to the research and experimentation, documentation thing, there's a lot of more sort of, in my mind, uh, introductory remediation techniques anybody can do once you get the, the setup ready, which is, uh, for example, growing mushrooms on a petri dish and introducing okay. different chemicals, and you can see them eat the chemical, yeah. and it's pretty amazing, you know, amazing every time. And then you know that's easy enough to do in a lab, and that that's actually been done many many times for a decade by people all around the world. Uh, the bigger challenge, and one of the things we're looking to do eventually, don't have anything going right yet, but also or similarly is is setting something up larger scale here in Portland, trying to translate that from the lab to an actual installation, clean up a uh, you know a brown field or or more more directly a, a specific site with sort of known pollutants and, and trying to clean up that soil or um, or even some water systems in the in the area. So yeah, cleaning up the water. So I think it's amazing the the, the promise and potential of uh, micro remediation in these places for environmental pollution and degraded lands. And you know, I I, I read on one of your campaigns that fungi can be used to remediate glyphosate. Or as people know it to be Roundup, you know the devastating product originally from Monsanto and now part of is now which is now part of Bayer. Do you do you have any specific examples of where that's been accomplished? Well, I mean I've done it myself. I mean again in the lab, it's it's, it's just it is fairly lab. easy. Um, yeah, to to introduce the you know material like for example like a piece of paper or other uh-huh. material soaked soaked in glyphosate, put it in in contact with mushroom mushroom has to sort of sit with it for a few days or weeks as it kind of figures mm-hmm. out how to eat it. And then eventually it starts to eat it. And I've done, done that. I've done that with other uh, compounds and it's, it's, uh, it's always amazing, but it's also fairly straightforward. But are there any large scale projects where people are, are trying to do this? Like you were saying about this mushroom insulation in Portland on the Willamette river. I mean, do you know of any places where people are actually trying to attempt to do a larger scale project around glyphosate? I think it's the um, Mississippi no, River. I mean, I think there's so many places where this is, you know. Yeah, not not specifically with, with glyphosate um, mm-hmm. off the top of my head, but I mean, there have been other um, groups, uh, private companies um, and, and some researchers here and there that have done work um, on usually more like uh, oil spills or petroleum-based product spills. Um, and they'll, they'll harvest that soil um, especially when it's really contained and you can just kind of excavate it and, and then introduce the mushroom in, in the best recipe type of way, you can actually have pretty incredible results. And, and the mycelium runs through it, does its digestion, breaks it all down, and you can significantly reduce the pollutant. Um, it's, it's much easier to, to do these things when it is a really kind of controlled and contained pile of material. When we go to okay. giant big ag and we're talking about uh-huh. you know, the, uh, states and states and states of cornfields. Right. Um, what does that mean? It means if you're really trying to remove the, the glyphosate, you're digging up all that soil, trying to run mycelium through it, which is a logistical feat. But then, you know, you disturb the soil even further, right. that, that soil's fallow for however long it takes. Um, uh-huh. so, so it's not as simple it, as it sounds. It sounds like this wonderful, you know, save the day, but it, there's more involved. 
Yeah, I mean that's the that's one of the bubbles I I unfortunately have to burst as as a teacher, and it was actually bursted for me back in, uh, in my younger days when I thought something similar. Fungi, oh, they can do everything; they're miracle workers, but they're living organisms with biological limitations, and they can only do so much. And as cultivators, we have to you know nurture them and give them just kind of the best environment to do their thing. And if we don't, they won't grow. And same thing happens out in a big sunny field, you know, where there's no water or something, they're not going to grow so well. Um, they won't be able to do their, their magical work that they can do in a lab where it's really controlled. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain examples. So that's the sort of the, 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 the unfortunate side of micromediation or the, the, the reality. You can't do it just anywhere, everywhere, throw it out of a helicopter and it'll grow <laughs> wherever you throw it. Um, as some people have suggested to me, but, the, <laughs> yeah. but there are, there are actually some uh, real world scenarios and, and certain types of pollution scenarios that are, that are essentially, there is no great answer for that fungi would potentially be the best scenario, best uh, solution for Such that. Yes. But in, in in heavy metal water treatment specifically, that's what I'm looking at here in, in Portland. That's the problem with the Willamette is heavy metal contamination, not so much chemicals. And when you have heavy metals uh, dissolved in water or in suspension in water, mycelium, sort of long story short, acts somewhat like a magnet and the, the metals will stick to the surface of the mycelium. So you can introduce even dead mycelium leftovers from a mushroom farm oh to your heavy metal contaminated water. The metals will stick to the mycelium. You pull the mycelium out. You can actually wash off the metals, recycle them, uh, make some money off that if you really want to, and <laughs> even use the same use the same mycelium, put it back in the river and do it all over again. And there, there's actually a company, the uh, best example of that, there's a company, I believe it's Finland, that does it with electronics waste to reclaim gold. And they make a big profit getting gold nice. via mycelium yeah. from electronics waste. So, But we could do this in all kinds of heavy metal polluted water. So we're talking about tailings ponds and tar mm -hmm. sands and mine you know, mining operations. Sure, um, oil. Well, not so much oil. That's that's uh, often the point of sort of mix up for a lot of folks is the mycelium really? can't really pull, you know, uh, chemicals out of water. It doesn't really, I mean, I could get into the details, but it doesn't mm -hmm. work as easily. The beauty of the heavy metal thing, heavy metals are, you know, again, getting into a little bit of the science. A chemical is a bunch of atoms all together as a molecule and the fungi can potentially break that down if given time and resources. Uh, heavy metal is just like an element, mercury, lead, et cetera. And uh, there's no actual chemical breakdown just the fungus, it, it bonds to it. it it's like a yeah. magnet, and then it pulls mm -hmm. it out. So it's a, it's a, it's quite different. Sometimes a little easy, a little bit difficult for people to, to get the difference. But yeah, so that's definitely one of the lower hanging fruits, um, and it's actually one of the one of the applications of micromediation you almost never hear about. And it's one of the ones I advocate for almost the most because it's oh, with the heavy metals. you know clean yeah cleaning up chemically laden soil is is very attractive, very uh, exciting, but. Again, you have to dig it all up. What's the reality with the logistics of it? It's actually, you know, there's only so many instances where that's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we have a lot of heavy metal contaminated waters. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, if I, I want to make sure we get to cover the Fungi Film Festival, which debuts this month. And you're the force behind this. I wanted you to talk about it a little bit. You know, what's inspiration for this festival and what can we expect from it? Yeah. So, well, I, the film festival was my idea initially, but um, I have two really wonderful friends and uh, collaborators, co-conspirators that we're all working together on it um, together. And it comes from, um, I've just, I have uh, a rich history in media. So alongside my ecology, my interests are in photography, audio engineering, video production. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I've been a movie head cinephile my whole life. And, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and um, you know, just uh, with the rise of the microcultural revolution, I said, you know, there might be interest finally, after sure. all these years of me watching people get more interested, maybe there's enough interest to pull, put together a film festival. And where it came from was we were, uh, my the th two other people we were going to do a radical mycology convergence this year as i say it's every other year normally and we were going to have the film festival as just a one day of this whole week long week of events and we had to cancel the convergence because yeah. it can only really be done in person we didn't want to do a digital uh, form and i said uh -huh. let's put our energy into an online film festival and so now we've just expanded this what was going to be a one day off thing to this much more fleshed out or, or larger more in, more uh you know invested event and to our great 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 surprise we not only got you know a handful of sort of oh here's us foraging videos or here's right. how to identify mushrooms which i thought was <laughs> going to be the bulk of it we got nearly a hundred films the vast majority of which were really incredible really creative really personal 
all kinds of movie every almost every movie genre you can think of was represented all kinds <laughs> of interesting abstract art pieces <laughs> many of many of them made for the film festival and so people were I mean, it speaks volumes, I think, to the current excitement around mycology, but also adding to the microculture people. It's they feel it in their bones, you know, when you mm-hmm. when you really dive into it, and it changes many people's lives. I've met many people and um, feel blessed to help sort of add to their their growing understanding of it all. Um, and so it's and so this is just meant to be an expression and a celebration of of a shared uh, enjoyment, passion, love for fungi, whatever whatever you have. What and is just learning about it? You're having a, a, when is the date of the festival? So it premieres um, October 16th. That's the first screening. We're going to do six live streams or they're, they're streamed uh, yeah, online. So you have to tune in live while they're happening. To go to fungifilmfest.com, you can see not only the full program, you can see all the lineup, uh, but also the, the dates. After the fest screens this month, and if listeners catch this later on, we will be... Um, making it able for organizations to essentially sort of uh, rent the whole program and screen it to their own local group. And that supports the artists as a part of that as well. We don't have that on the website right now, but that will be coming. So it will sort of tour, digitally tour, if you will, this way for the whole year. Hopefully by next year, there'll actually be people will be able to do in-person screenings and things like that too. But yeah, this month we're, we're doing it through the website and yeah, it's going to be really good. We have just over, we have a couple, uh, excuse me, we have over 30 films and it's going to be combined roughly three and a half hours with an intermission. So a solid yeah. night of amazing films from Fantastic. over 10, uh, 10 countries rather from around the world. So Peter, I wanted to ask, how can listeners stay in contact with you? We, we unfortunately have to wrap up. We could talk about mushrooms for a week straight and fungi, but uh, if you could just tell us how can listeners stay in contact with you and some of the work that you're doing, where's the best place? For them to turn well um the or... three the, yeah the three main organizations have spoken about radicalmycology.com or you can find us at radical rad mycology rather on social media um we're doing a bunch of behind the scenes uh, cultural changes on our own and so the website's uh, being re- rebuilt but there's stuff coming down the pipe mycologos.world if you want to check out the educational offerings there also, there's a bunch of new stuff coming down the pipe and some exciting stuff. So joining the email list or social media is a good way to hear about new stuff in the future. And then the Fungi Film Fest, as I just mentioned, is at fungifilmfest.com and also at Fungi Film Fest on social. Thank you so much for all of the incredible efforts you are doing on behalf of just spreading the microculture around the world because it is so much needed. And I do feel that it will absolutely change the world the more people reconnect to fungi and um, yeah, truly engage it. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Peter. We hope to have you on again and uh, more power to all your work with the fungi. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. Thank you to our guest today, Peter McCoy from Mycologos. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. This has been Radical Mycology. The future is fungi. Please connect with us on social media at Ego Justice Radio and SoCal 350. If you like what you heard and you want others to be informed, subscribe to our podcast and share the episodes. You have been listening to Ego Justice Radio, a project of SoCal 350. The show can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and at ecojusticeradio.org. Created by Mark and J.P. Morris, executive producer Jack I, engineer Blake Lampkin, interview hosted by Carrie Kim, and original music by Javier Cadre. And until next time, remember, the power is yours.